أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله أستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا من يهده لا فلا مدل ومن يدل فلا هادي وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له عز وجل وأشهد أن محمد عن عبده ورسوله صلى الله عليه وسلم أرسله بالحق بشيرا ونذيرا بين يدي الساعة من يتع الله ورسوله فقد رشده وَمَنْ يَأْتِهِ مَا فَإِنَّ لَا يَدُرُّ إِلَى نَفْسَهُ وَلَا يَدُرُ لَهَا شَيْئًا أَمَّا بَأَلْ فَقَالَ لَهُ تَعَالَى فِي الْقُرَانِ الْقَرِيمِ فِي السورة الروم بسم الله وَمِنْ عَيَاتِهِ خَلَقَ خَلْقُ ومن آياته خلق السماوات والأرض وإختلاف سنتكم ووانكم إن في ذلك لآيات للآلمين وصدق الله عليم بارك الله لي ولكم في القرآن الكريم ونفعني وياكم بالذكر الحكيم إنه هو جواد رعوف رحيم الآن حي التاج I seek refuge in Allah from Satan from Shaitan the accursed devil In the name of Allah the merciful the compassionate praise be to Allah I seek his help and beg his forgiveness and we seek refuge in Allah from the mischief and the evils of our souls Whomsoever Allah guides, there is none who can lead that person astray. And whomsoever Allah finds in error, there is none to guide them. I bear witness that there is no God, no deity worthy of worship, except Almighty Allah, glory be to him, who is one alone and unique without partner or associate. And I bear witness further that Prophet Muhammad ibn Abdullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam May the peace and blessings of Allah be upon him as Allah's servant, messenger, and apostle. And he, Allah, has sent his messenger in truth and with the truth as a bearer of glad tidings and also as a warner in advance of the hour of judgment. Therefore, whomsoever obeys Allah and his messenger, surely that person is rightly guided, and whomsoever disobeys the two of them, Surely that person harms only his or her own soul, and they harm not Allah the least little bit. As for what follows, for Allah, glory be to him, has uh, said in the Quran, the 30th surah of the Quran, Surah to Rome, the Roman Empire, ayah number 22. Allah says, and among his signs is the creation of the heavens and the earth and the variations in your languages and your colors. Verily in that are signs for those who know. And surely Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has spoken the truth. O you who worship Allah. Language is a medium for the facilitation of communication and the promotion of oneness of thought. Language is a medium for facilitation of communication and promotion of the oneness of thought. And the oneness of thought is essential. Unity of thought is essential to unity of action. 
if people would act together, they must first think together. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the verse that we have just heard from the Quran, he points to the ikhtilaf of sina'ikum, the uh, variations or the diversity of our tongues, of our languages, as well as of our uh, complexions, as a sign, a sign created by him. The degrees of difference between human beings are part of the mystery of life. Genetically, scientists have determined that all human beings are the same. But though we are the same on the inside. On the outside, we have <coughs> degrees of difference. No two human beings are the same. No two human beings have the same fingerprints. Man has advanced scientifically to the point now where they're able to determine the prints on the retina of the eye. No two human beings have the same retina prints. We are all different, but the same. And Allah, Tabaraka wa Ta'ala, has created us and gifted us with various means to transcend our differences and to be one. In the verse that we have just heard, and actually it's, it's one of, of uh, a few verses where Allah is speaking of uh, the diversity in his creation. How many different types of flowers are there, though they are all uh, flowers? How many different types or, 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 of creatures in the same species? How many different types of fish are there, even though they all fish? How many different types of birds are there, although they're all birds? The diversity of creation is one of the things that stimulates the curiosity of man. And by delving into the differences in creation, by striving to understand the degrees of difference even within the same species, it leads to greater understanding. When we look at the physical characteristics of people, the more we delve into them, the more we learn about them. How boring it would be if we were all identical. When we look into the diversity of the creation, when we look at the diversity in our complexion, the diversity in our uh, 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 culture, the diversity in our foods, all of this diversity lends to a greater understanding and I might add appreciation of the wonder of man. Well, Allah says, the same with our languages. How many different tongues are spoken by human beings? And when we strive to 
learn each other's languages or at least to be able to communicate with each other in spite in spite of the diversity of our languages then it leads to a greater understanding of each other as people but there are times and there are situations and circumstances that demand a core understanding, a core communication, a core fundamental language. Let me give you an example. When human beings from all over the planet Earth go to the United Nations in order to sit down and to discuss the affairs of human beings and to seek a common interest across the lines of their diversity. You go down to the UN during General Assembly time, you see some of everybody down there, all different colleges, colors, speaking all different kind of languages, all different kind of, of, uh, uh, of, of manners of dress. But when they go into the General Assembly, where they have to discuss matters of common concern, you see them sitting with a set of earphones on. And on the broadcast end of those earphones is a battery of people translating what's being said so that in spite of their diversity, they're speaking a common language. And in speaking a common language, they're able to communicate with one another. And as the result of them being able to communicate with one another, to communicate with a oneness, then they're able to act with a oneness in their common interest. O you who worship Allah. In the scriptures, there is a... Um, a narrative that is well known to the Aqlul Kitab, is well known to the people of the book, Jews and Christians. And this particular narrative is found in the book of Genesis, wherein it is related that a group of people who lived in a territory in what we would now call the Eurasian continent in an area known as Shinar came together in order to erect a monument. And they pooled their resources. They tapped their oneness of thought in promotion of a oneness of action. And they built a tremendous tower. And the tower was so uh, tall and so magnificent that it was wondrous. They were in Shina, and the town that they were in was called Babel. And the Tower of Babel was so tall and so wondrous that at one time it was referred to as uh, one of the eight wonders of the world. Tower of Babel, it was called. And when we examine the scripture, the biblical narrative says that when the tower reached its height, and you can see it, there are, uh, I mean, you can pick up just about any book of archaeology or any book of ancient history, and you'll see the Tower of Babel. In fact, the Tower of Babel became a... Uh, uh, 
a prototype for smaller versions of the same thing built throughout that region of the world. Just as you have a great pyramid and you have a lot of other smaller pyramids built on the same model. Why do you mention this, Iman Talib? I mention it because the scriptural narrative says that when this tower reached its height, that the people who built it became uh, uh, very proud and very haughty uh, 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 with regards to their accomplishments. And the scripture says that the Lord looked on them and decided to humble them. And he used the vehicle of language to humble them. And the scripture says that the Lord confused the one language of the people of Babel. And instead of them speaking one language, they began speaking a variety of languages and lost their ability to communicate with one another and therefore lost their ability to think with oneness and therefore lost their ability to act with oneness and to reach the uh, uh, maximum height of their human potential. O oh, you who worship Allah, as Muslims, we have been given a language. This language is such that when we all speak it, when we speak the common language, it promotes a oneness of thought in us as Muslims. And history has shown that when the Muslims speak the one language, then they think with oneness and act or have acted with oneness and that they have reached great heights of human potential, great heights of civilization, great heights of accomplishments. What is that one language? It is the language of the Quran and Sunnah. It is the language of the Quran and the Sunnah the language emanating from the revelation to Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the language emanating from the prophetic tradition of the Messenger of Allah that is responsible for the height of Muslim culture and civilization globally. The Muslim empire of the past has been, was a global empire. If you looked at the rulers and the inhabitants of the Muslim empire during the glorious days, you found tremendous diversity there. The empire wasn't a uh, just in one part of the world or another part. It was global. The empire was in Arabia. The empire was in Africa. The empire was in Europe. The empire was in Asia. It was a global empire. A global uh, caliphate, if you will. Yet, in spite of the variety of languages, uh, uh, you know, ethnic languages and culture and food and all of that sort of thing. In spite of that, 
the Ummah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that faith community of Muhammad spoke, thought, and acted with a oneness. And at that time was a leader on the world stage. But if we examine the full history of the Ummah, we see that that great towering monument of culture and civilization reached its height and then began to disintegrate. Till now, if we look around the world, we see Muslims everywhere. Wherever there are human beings, there are Muslims. There are Muslims in Africa and Asia in the Americas, Muslims in the Pacific, Muslims in Antarctica where there aren't even any other human beings. Up there where it's so cold you have to be Muslim. <laughs> Uh, you know, it's, it's so cold in Antarctica that it freezes any false thought. You don't have time and energy to be thinking sideways. You got to be right, got to be right on it. No, no, really, you, you, could, you could investigate this for yourself. But in spite of the fact that there are Muslims everywhere, in spite of the fact, as I, I quoted uh, a couple of weeks ago, I was quote, quoting this latest Pew uh, study from their Center for uh, Global Research on Religion. And the Pew Center, which is PW, Pew Center here in America, they said that, that Islam, the Islamic way of life, is growing and multiplying with tremendous speed. And I might add, not because of what the Muslims are doing, but rather in spite of what we're doing. This is Allah's design, Allah's program. In spite of all of the Islamophobia and the, the Muslims murdering other Muslims and all the bad, in spite of all of that, Pew Center says that in just a matter of years, Islam is going to move up from number two in terms of number of people globally adhering to a religion. You know, right now we're number two behind Christianity. But very soon we'll be tied for number one. This, this is what the study says. But in spite of this, these vast numbers, in spite of the fact that Islam is, is uh, being practiced to a level or to a height or to a degree in America unprecedented in American history. In fact, we don't even have to talk about America. We can just look at New York. More masjids in New York than any other time since the city was... was uh, uh, built more halal food places, uh, you know, than any other. The Islam is exploding, but in spite of that, we find the Ummah of Muhammad sallallahu in America and throughout the world fitting the description of a prophecy of Muhammad ibn Abdullah Rasulullah sallallahu May the peace and blessings of Allah be upon him. What prophecy? Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, said there will come a time when Muslims would be so weak and so divided that their enemies would feast upon them like diners at a table. And so in spite of our numbers, we find ourselves fitting that description. 
we find ourselves being attacked from the right, the left, from in front of us, behind us, above and below. We find ourselves with uh, 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 so confused that Muslims are involved in life and death struggles and they don't even know who the enemy is. When you turn on your television set and you're watching the news and you see about, you know, bombs exploding here and this mosque and that mosque and Muslims being kidnapped by other Muslims and all that, you know what? In reality, you don't know who that is, man. I mean, the truth of the matter is, you don't know who that is. And neither do they. They don't know who's doing that. If I was an enemy of Muslims, if I was an enemy of Muslims, I would be doing everything that I could to sow division and dissension in the ranks of the Muslims and make it look like it's other Muslims doing it. That, that's how enemies operate. That's the nature of stratagem. The prophet, peace be upon him, said war is stratagem, he said. So I remember, for instance, years ago in Iraq, when the war in Iraq, the modern war in Iraq first started, I remember watching news reports saying that the Sunni Muslims in Iraq and the Shia Muslims in Iraq had put aside their differences and were fighting together against allied forces that had invaded their country. I, I remember this. Maybe some of you remember it. Now, they've put aside the common struggle against a common enemy and gone right back to fighting each other. How did that happen? What happened to break up that unity amongst the Muslims and put them back in a position of being weak and being divided to the point where they have to call in their enemy to make peace between them. These are important questions to ask. But one thing is certain. We are confused as a people. And the point of my reminder to you today has been to say that we have become confused because our language has become confused. The common language that in the past united us, I'm not talking about Arabic, that's sublime a language that is, because the fact of the matter is most Muslims in the world don't speak Arabic. The fact of the matter is that Muslims, the majority of Muslims in the world have never spoken Arabic, except by vehicle of the Quran. It is the common language of a, a, a clear core understanding of the Quran and a clear core fundamental understanding of the uh, 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 sunnah of Prophet Muhammad salam, that was the one language. Now that language has become confused. Now you see uh, uh, Muslims everywhere but we speak in all different kind of languages. Some, one person speaks, uh, uh, somebody over here is speaking language of the Quran and Sunnah. I'm a Muslim. Some other Muslim over here, he put aside language of Quran and and suddenly he's speaking communist language. Or some other Muslim, he's put aside the language of the Quran and Sunnah, and he's speaking some old secular language of disbelief. So that that which in the language of the Quran and Sunnah says this is lawful and this is unlawful, we find it being flipped now. 
So people who are Muslims, you find them talking a confused language. Muslims who don't believe in God. Muslims that say, you know, uh, uh, I, I, I follow the Quran, but I don't follow the Sunnah. Muslims who say, well, uh, the, the, the Quran is outdated, and we need to update the Quran, and we need to reform Islam, not reform the actions of Muslim. Not reform the actions of Muslim, reform Islam. We need to take the laws of Islam and throw them out the window and adapt these laws from over here. Confusion of language. We find Muslims declaring themselves to be following the Quran and Sunnah, but acting contrary to that which they declare. Confusion. And so, again, confusion of language leading to confusion of thought, leading to confusion of action. In spite of the fact, you know, as I remember when I was young as a Muslim, we used to say, how many Islams are there? One. How many Allahs are there? One. How many Prophet Muhammad ibn Abdullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam are there? One. How many brotherhoods of the, of, of the prophets are there? As a sort of NBI. One. So then why we got all this, <laughs> why are we acting as if there's more than one Islam, more than one Allah? More than one uh, 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 Pro Prophet Muhammad alayhi salam was salam. We must strive for oneness. We must humble ourselves that uh, perhaps Allah Tabaraka wa Ta'ala will have mercy on us and restore us to a oneness of language. We, sh we should be making dua for this. We should be making supplication to Allah, asking Allah to bring the divided hearts of the Muslims and the divided minds of the Muslims back to a point of oneness. Back to a point of, uh, of uh, unity. Back to a point of resonance. So there is a hadith that uh, says uh, once some ha sahaba, companion, they went to the messenger of Allah and this is a very interesting hadith because uh, they weren't uh, questioning him about anything that was going on right then. They were, at, they were speaking to a prophet and they were speaking about that which would happen. They said, Ya Rasulullah, what should we do if the affairs of the Muslims become so confused that we're divided, one group calling us this way, another group calling us that way, and one group saying this, and another group amongst the Muslims saying this, this is a Sahih Hadith. They asked them. Why? Because they could see that that time would come. In fact, it didn't even take that long. Right after the Prophet passed away, a group of Muslims popped up during the Caliphate of Abu Bakr al Siddiq and said, Man, we're not paying those that call, man. <laughs> right after the Prophet passed away, they stood up. Now, during the Prophet's time, there was one language with regards to zakat, and therefore one understanding, one obligation, one action. Prophet passes away, a group of Muslims stand up and say, uh, we are, we're not paying those zakat, man. Speaking a different language, man. To such a point, you read the hadith, it's a hadith, uh, uh, a narrate, authentic narration by Umar ibn al-Khattab, 
he says, he's relating, he's talking to Abu Bakr about this. And Abu Bakr, who was one of the most balanced, moderate, even keel thinking people, Abu Bakr turned to Umar, he said, if they don't pay the zakah, I'm going to fight them, man. I'm going to declare war. And you read the hadith that Umar said, the intensity of Abu Bakr's statement surprised Umar ibn al-Khattab, whose very personality embodied intensity and in fighting, who was glad to bust somebody upside the head, fisa I mean, Umar ibn al-Khattab, radiallahu an, of whom it is said that when he walked, the prophet said, if Umar is walking down the street and shaitan is coming from the opposite direction and sees Umar, shaitan, he get off the road and take another path. That Umar ibn al-Khattab. Umar ibn al-Khattab who, uh, on his way to assassinate the messenger of Allah. Uh, I mean, I got to take a minute for this here, man. Umar ibn al-Khattab, his his sister accepts Islam. Umar goes to his sister's house, beats her and her husband up. <laughs> no, not just her, her and her husband for their audacity to accept the one language of the Quran and Sunnah instead of the confused language of the many gods of Mecca and the Arabs of the Jahiliyyah. Umar goes, kicks in the door, beats up the, his sister and her husband, and is on his way to assassinate the messenger of Allah, alayhi salam wa salam, when he hears the sweet voice uh, uh, reciting the words of the Quran. And it turns his heart to the point where he goes from being an enemy of Islam to a staunch defender of Islam. That Umar ibn al-Khattab said, I spoke to Abu Bakr and I told him, you got a group of Muslims over here who've abandoned the language and the oneness of language of the Quran and Sunnah and are saying they're not going to pay zakah. And, and, and he said, Abu Bakr, the balanced one, said, if they don't pay the zakah, I'm going to fight them. And they didn't, and he did. So he rounded up the, 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 the army of the Muslims, and as we would say in the vernacular, rolled on them. Why? Because the disruption of the oneness of the language was intolerable. Oh, you who worship Allah, reflect upon that. Because I uh, started to say the Sahaba, they say, Ya Rasulullah, what should we do when it get like that? This, this is the point. They say, Ya Rasulullah, what, what, what should we do when, when the Muslims get all confused and divided and everybody's calling us, come over here, we should do this. Come over there, we should do that. The Prophet, peace be upon him, said, told us, group of companions, he said, Hold fast to the Quran and Sunnah, he said, like a person grabbing a tree and biting into the bark with their teeth. You know, you ever study about tornadoes? You know, when these, uh, right here in America, when tornadoes hit, they devastate everything in their path. So recently I was watching a little thing on the Weather Channel and they, they said, what should you do if you're walking outside, not in like the city, but you're in Kansas or something in tornado territory. They said, they said uh, what should you do if you're walking outside and you look and see a tornado coming? And they said, well, first, uh, and they gave different options. But, and, but one of them said, final option find something that's rooted to the ground and hold on to it if you can tie yourself to it <laughs> and just hold on for dear life don't try to run don't try to, you know what I'm saying? I'm saying tie yourself to it and hold on for dear life well we're in 
the times of a tornado. We're in times of great confusion as Muslims. We're in times where the ummah is divided and you got a group over here calling to one degree of madness and another group over here calling to another degree of madness and all of them uh, on the surface speaking one language but their actions reveal a divided language. Again, prophesied by Rasulullah he said there will come a time when the Muslims will be murdering each other and on both sides of the conflict, he said, the declaration would be La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. Is that not the time in which we're living? Tumultuous times. When the tornado of dissent and confusion has descended upon us during what should be a time of great glory for us. What should we do? Hold fast. Tie yourself in. I'm not saying become fanatic, become inflexible, become crazy in the name of Islam. Sheikh Allama Tawfiq, Mu'allimi, Rahmatullahi. He used to say, people go crazy in the name of different things, and some people go crazy in the name of Islam. No, don't go crazy. Stay balanced, but hold fast. This is not the time to be, uh, 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 you know, Declaring yourself to be a Muslim, living like a Christian, practicing martial arts like a Buddhist, doing business like a Jew. <laughs> no, man, we need oneness. We need oneness. We need to worship as Muslims, socialize as Muslims, conduct business as Muslims. This, this is what the time de demands, hold fast to the Quran and Sunnah or be swept away by the winds of the tornado. May Allah guide us to a oneness of language. Subhanakallah. أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله صلى الله عليه وسلم اللهم بارك وسلم على سيدنا ومولانا محمد عليه السلام والسلام وآل آله وأصحابه وأنصاره أجمعين برحمتك يا أحم الراحمين وبعد فقال الله تعالى في في سورة البقرة تلك أمة قد خلت لها ما كسبت ولكم في ولكم ما كسبتم ولا تسألون عما كانوا يعلمون سيقول السفهاء من الناس ما و و ولاهم ولاهم عن قبلهم ملتي كانوا عليها كل للا مشرك للا مشرك والمغرب يهدي من يشاء إلى سرات مستقيم وكذلك جعلناكم أمة وسطا لتكون شهداء على الناس ويكون الرسول عليكم شهيدا وما جعلنا القبلة التي كنت عليها إلا لنعلم من من يتبع الرسول مما ينقلب على أكبيه وإن كانت لا كبيرة إلا على الذين حد الله وما كان لا ليدي إيمانكم إن الله بالناس لا رؤوف رحيم وصلى الله عليه
اللهم اغفر لنا مسلمين ومسلمة ومؤمنين ومؤمنات ومؤمنين ومحسنات وبعد Dear believers, let me uh, end here. This is one, two, three verses from Surah Al-Baqarah. That was a people that has passed away. They shall reap the fruit of what they did and you of what you do. You will not be asked about what they did. The fools among the people will say, what has turned them from the Qibla to which they were used? Say to Allah belong both east and west. He guided whom he will to a way that is straight. Thus have we made of you a justly balanced ummah that you may might be witnesses over the nation and the messenger a witness over yourselves. And we appointed the Qibla to which you were used only to test those who followed the messenger from those who would turn on their heels from the faith. Indeed, it was a momentous change except to those guided by Allah. And never would Allah make your faith, your iman, of no effect. For Allah is to all people most surely full of kindness, most merciful. Let me end with this. I think it was last week I made reference to uh, the occurrence in uh, the history of Islam when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commanded the Muslims <coughs> to stop uh, facing Jerusalem for their salah and to do an about face and to pray in the exact opposite direction towards the Kaaba or in the direction of the Kaaba. That direction is called uh, Qibla. And uh, Qibla is not a direction on a compass. Qibla is a direction of psychological and spiritual orientation. Qibla is a direction of psycho-spiritual orientation. And when you understand it that way, then you understand the significance of Allah changing the Qibla of the Muslim. It wasn't about a geographical uh, 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 location. As I said last week, you know, we're not praying to the east or the west. We're praying to Allah. And Allah is the Lord of the east and the west. We're in the western hemisphere. In New York, we kind of turn north, northeast. You know, if you was on the opposite side of the world, you might be praying west, southwest. If you was one of those Muslims up in, the, up in Antarctica, you'd be praying southwards. Uh, this is, and when you get to the Kaaba, the Muslims line up for the Salah. Everybody lines up in a straight line, but we're praying in a circle on every side of the Kaaba. So it's not about the, the physicality. It's about the psychological and spiritual orientation. So they got to a point in their development where Allah said, all right. Time for you to be yourself now. You've been following the same trajectory as everybody else, following the same trajectory as uh, Jews, following the same trajectory uh, 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 as the Christians, and that's good. You can have a relationship with the people of the book, but you are who you are. You are the people of the Quran and Sunnah, so now you're going to have to carve out your own direction. And Allah said to the Ummah of Muhammad, about faith. And they turned around, and now they're facing their own direction. Muslims are the only ones who pray in the direction of the Kaaba. Nobody else but us. So this was an order from Allah 
to speak the common language, but you must have oneness of your own language. You must have a oneness of your orientation. And Allah says, we made you a balanced ummah so that you could be witnesses over the nation and they be witnesses on, over you. And we only did that. We only gave that command to test you to see who was going to hold fast and who was going to punk out. And that, and that test is still being issued today. If you want to turn your back on Islam, you can make a whole lot of money nowadays. You'll be like, uh, what's her name, uh, Asan Ali, or one of these other people running around talking against Islam, calling for the dismantling of Sharia. Somebody said to me the other day, well, yeah, you Muslims, y'all want to impose Sharia on everybody. I said, man, don't be ridiculous, man. And I asked them, what is your, con what is, what is your concept of Sharia? What are you talking about? I asked this person. Well, you know, you you all cut off people's hands, and you 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 uh, you know what I mean. You punish people if they commit adultery, and you they apostate. You do. I, I said that's your concept of Sharia. Yeah, yeah, you know that's the Sharia. I, I said, oh, uh, what you're talking about are the penal laws of Sharia, because the law of Islam, Sharia, that governs everything. The way we eat the way we dress, the way we socialize, the way we conduct business, how we punish our criminals, all of that go into this great body of law called Sharia. And so when you hear people talking against Sharia, you have to stop them and ask, what are you talking about? Now, so, now if you got a beef with the penal laws of Islam, fine, let's talk about that. And while we're talking about penal laws, let's talk about penal laws in the United States of America. Uh, don't don't pretend like in is, Islam is the only system of governance that that has capital punishment. Yeah, pet capital punishment right here in America. Don't don't talk about. See this 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 how you have to back them up and keep them from confusing our language. But as the Muslims get confused, and then the next thing you know, here you have a Muslim saying, "Yeah, no, we need to do away with Sharia." Oh oh. Uh, uh, they say something about jihad. Oh no, I'm not. I'm. Uh, I'm not in favor of jihad. I'm. I'm just trying to be a Muslim. I'm. I'm. I'm one of the good guys. Why? Because they confuse. You got to back them up. What level of jihad are you talking about? And every declared jihad is not a jihad. You see, you got to be able to talk like that, based on oneness of language and oneness of thought. May Allah help. May Allah help us to understand the way of life that he has guided us to. May we all embrace unapologetically. As one of the younger generation Muslims, I, I heard him say a few years ago, he said, listen, man, I'm unapologetically Muslim. That's how we have to be. Una not fanatically Muslim. Allah didn't say he raised us up to be fanatics. But you know what? When you live in a world of fanaticism, <laughs> When you live in a world of fanaticism, your moderation will look like fanaticism to fanatics. Did you hear what I just said? I, I got it here, yeah, man. I said, if you're in a world of fanatics, your moderation looks like fanaticism to fanatics. Uh, people say, what? You don't drink? Oh, you're a fan alcohol. You don't drink alcohol? Oh, man, that's fanatical. Your, your women are not walking around uncovered and half naked. Mm -hmm. That's fanatical. What? You pray five times a day. That's fanatical. See, that's what we need to get rid of. We need to get rid of that fanatical orientation of the Muslim. What? You're not in favor of usury? That's fanatical. Every, no, 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 no. Allah has made us members of a moderate, balanced nation according to the one language of the Quran and the Sunnah. And may we embrace that language that Allah might bless us with oneness of thought and oneness of action. Subhanakallahum wa bihamdik. Ashadu an la ilaha illallah. Astaghfiruka wa atubu alik. Ameen. Wa alka ikamah.